you're joining us, hopefully you're joining us on one of our platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV, Roku, Time Warner Cable, Fios, and we're also Bloomberg Radio Affiliates. So you may be listening to us on WSTX Bloomberg or in one of our 90 Latin markets on La Mega Mundial. However you are viewing and watching us, welcome, and we're so excited to have you here. Today, our guest on Marketplace TV is Dr. N. Kim Okeke. I'm so excited to bring this wonderful guest on. Hello, Dr. N. Kim. May I please call you Dr. N. Kim? I, I love your whole beautiful name, but may I call you Dr. N. Kim? Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Our listeners and our viewers are really going to be excited about the things that we're going to talk about over the course of the next hour. Thank so you for having me. It is our pleasure indeed. And if you will let me take the liberty, I'd love to read a little of your bio so that they can kind of get a sense. We're going to dig into you uh, as much as possible in a very kind and loving way, but we're going to dig more into your history and your expertise. But I want to just give them some background knowledge. So Dr. N. Kem Annabelle Okeke is uh, an award-winning Kaizen entrepreneur, and we're going to ask her about that Kaizen bit in a little bit. You're a physician executive and a transformation coach with a successful career spanning over two decades. That's exciting by itself. You are the founder of Medical Links, and Medical Links is you have an amazing team, and you all advise and support healthcare leaders. So that's critical. And also healthcare organizations on strategic solutions to enhance implementation, framework strategy, improve operational efficiencies and outcomes, and increase revenue vol volume and revenue streams. That's a mouthful, but I know you're going to help us understand that better. It's interesting that over the course of your career, you have delivered multi-million dollar cost savings and solutions and improved population health outcome for thousands of lives. And this is really exciting to just look at some of the leadership positions you have held. You have done so notably, this is not all of them, but notably at Kaiser Permanente, Booz Allen Hamilton, and at Johns Hopkins. You are the founder of three other companies, Health Links, Coordinate, and we're going to find out about that, as well as Consociator. So that is a mouthful. Dr. Inkem, such a pleasure. <laughs> That's a big resume. I really have to tell you, that is a very big resume, and you are a lovely individual. So just out of the gate, one of the things, sometimes when we get to meet people in a professional setting, or even as a physician or physician executive, we don't really get a sense, we don't get a chance to know who they are behind the scenes. And I know that's very important for you. So can I ask you to please take the liberty, tell us about yourself. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and I'm happy to be here. So about myself, I'll start with my story. Um, I'll begin with my parents. Uh, they uh, married in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I was born. Uh, but I was uh, raised in Nigeria. We left uh, before I was five years old. And my roots are Igbo, from the Igbo tribe. So uh, from a local uh, government area called Idemili, and they refer to the girls from there as Adide, so probably so. I am the third of six children, five girls and a boy. And I think my younger years was something that I didn't think much about until I grew up, which is in my in my culture, it's it's very common for you to appreciate the boy child in, in one way and the girl child in another. So my dad having five girls and one boy, he was he was a, a couple notches down there. So <laughs> he decided uh, to himself that you know what, I can I can flip this to a huge advantage, and invest in my one son, uh, as well as my five girls. So growing up, uh, we didn't see any uh, difference in terms of the respect uh, my dad uh, had for his son and the girls, and he invested in us, uh, you know, education and all, and ended up with three physicians and three engineers. Okay, so wait a minute. <laughs> if I can pause right there, because that, that deserves applause. For him. <laughs> no, really for him, because when you think about it, 
that wasn't always the way. If, if, if a family had a son, obviously the son is the one that carries on the name. And typically there is more investment, not, not always, but, but typically there is more investment there. And sometimes as girls were told to go and, and do other things. So here with your five sisters and your one brother, the family has three physicians and three engineers. That is correct. Uh, that's fantastic. That is absolutely fantastic. So, okay. so now that you're telling, okay, we're learning a little bit about his fairness, but what were the values that you were raised with that are so important to you? So the values I was raised with was work hard, um, be honest. Uh, and those two go hand in hand. My dad will often say, if you're honest and you work hard, you will never lack. Um, my mom, on the other hand, supported that notion, but she will also say cleanliness is next to godliness. So as a nurse, <laughs> she always <laughs> liked being in a neat environment. She was super meticulous. So those are the, the values that I had growing up. And uh, again, hindsight is twenty twenty. Now that I'm all grown and a mother too, I, I see where all those skill sets are, are applicable and how they help me be, be who I am today. Love to hear that. So you mentioned, so obviously education was important to your father, but as far as the family, you mentioned your mom was a nurse, correct? Yes. And what was your father's profession? My dad was an engineer. Oh. So he was a Pittsburgh, yeah. He he, uh, he did his first degree in Nigeria in Amado uh, Villa University. And then he got a full ride to University of Pittsburgh where he did a double master. So wow. uh, you will hear later on where that came from in my, in my own journey. <laughs> That so, and then, yeah, and then he uh, decided to go back to Nigeria. He left the family here. His friend told him, you know, they've discovered oil back in Nigeria and things are booming. Why don't you come back? So he left my mom and the kids here, went back. He, he founded his own engineering firm. And it, it, it seems like things were going well. So he uh, gave my mom the option to stay here with the kids while he worked there. They did that for a couple of years. She felt, you know what, no. I think we're too young a family to, to keep living that way. So uh, she relocated the family back to Nigeria and we lived in the Northern part of Nigeria where my dad, you know, ran his company for three decades before he retired. Wow, that's amazing. So let me ask you this, the when you think in terms of the, um, well, obviously your dad had all this, this goal of, of everybody having a great education and clearly your mom supported that as well but what how did that impact fa family life if mom's a nurse and yet you all are here you're in the, uh, you're living in Pittsburgh what was daily life like can you can you recall any pivotal moments for yourself you are smart well with, with when she eventually said you know having more kids you could imagine how difficult that became so my mom did quit her job so that she could be more present um, and that helped because dad was always traveling, but he always made time for us. He, he was our tutor. We never had any tutor. Uh, he would tutor us in math, physics, chemistry. Oh my um, he loved to teach. Um, my mom, on the other hand, kind of, you know, didn't want to go in his turf. So she focused more on us being very domesticated, including my brother, um, and making sure that we were grounded in Christianity as, uh, you know, Christians and make sure we went to Sunday school and, you know, uh, get our sacraments as the time went on. So uh, I think that that was her value until today. That's our true north where when all else fails, uh, then you have to rely on God. Well, that, you know, that's interesting. And those kinds of values are what keep family together. Now, all of your siblings, you have all of your siblings. Are you a very close family? You're cl clearly a very uh, accomplished family. Are you all very close even now? We are close. I mean, we're not without our own differences. We are, you know, very opinionated women <laughs> <laughs> and a very opinionated brother. Uh, but all in all, I think my dad's recent passing uh, mm -hmm. about a year ago did, again, show its face on, on all the work that my parents have put in uh, to make sure that we stayed close. So we are overall close um, and that hasn't changed. We love each other so much. There's nothing we won't do for each other. Um, so that, that's a testament to the values that they put in us. And, and not only in the immediate family, we also extend this uh, beyond um, 
our family to friends and extended family, for sure. Well, I think that's really important because that kind of the kind of um, qualities that you're talking about, I think as we as we develop your story a little bit on, we're going to see just how the importance of family, closeness, values, uh, trying to be an honest person and really uh, a person of good moral character. I think that those are some of the reasons that definitely contribute to your huge success as it relates to the various companies that you've started and what you're doing. So when we come back from our break, we're going to dig more into your education and lessons learned. So everybody stay tuned with, with Dr. Inkem. My name is Carolyn Howell, and I'm the executive producer of the Caribbean Food Network, the newest and the most fabulous way to eat, drink, and think food, fun, anything culinary, travel, tourism, you name it, we're it. Right now, I'm standing in Cookology, or at least one of the Cookologies. Cookology is a fabulous recreational and professional way to learn how to cook. And isn't that what we all want to do? Eating is how we keep going. So in a minute, I'm going to introduce you to Maria. Maria is the founder and the owner of Cookology. We're so excited about our partnership and what the Caribbean Food Network is going to do. We can't wait for you to see. So sit tight. Hey everyone, welcome to Cookology Culinary School. This is our location in Boston Quarter. We have been here since 2019. We have another one in Dallas Town Center. We've been there since 2009. We've been in business for 13 whole years, aside from the pandemic, which I did a lot of sleeping. But here we are. You want to look in? This is what you see when you come by Boston Quarter. It's fun. It's fun. It's potential fun. Everybody is looking to do something with their friends and family. So here is the front door. Follow the summit. I'm setting an example for my kids. I got be a side hustle. I have more control of my destiny. I need multiple streams of income. It's hard work, but I'm working for me. A job is cool, but I need more. It's all about being self-employed. You're tuned into the world of self-employed and rising with Art Taylor, where we bring you the amazing stories of people who are challenging the odds and following their dreams of self-employment. Learn from their successes and be inspired. Hear creative ideas for your business and find tips to take your hustle to another level.
Welcome back. We're here with Dr. N. Kim OKK. We are at the Marketplace TV on our TV network, and we're having a wonderful discussion about Dr. N. Kim. We're going to call her. Dr. N. Kim has been telling us a little bit about her upbringing and her background. She's one of six children. She has one brother and four sisters. So it is five girls, one boy. And in the family, they are now three engineers and three doctors. And so you were giving us some great background. And we, I think we've gotten to learn a lot about your value system and why that's so important to you. But this whole education piece, I want to focus now on your education. When you got into medical school, when you decided you were going to be a doctor versus an engineer, come on, share your story, please. Of course. Uh, so my career journey, I guess, starts with inspiration. And uh, I have three lovely daughters who I pull inspiration from my mom as a strong woman. But my power inspiration comes from my dad. And now he's passed away. I see him as my guardian angel. And you can see his photo behind me. I feel he's always watching my back. And uh, Carolyn, you can relate to this. I, I, I know we share that in common. Now our, our fathers have passed. And I, I told a friend of mine, we are not fatherless daughters. We are fathered legacies. So I, I, I remember that and the tears dry up quickly because he's done his job and I have my mind to do now. So that's where I draw my inspiration from. So his ability to educate us taught us how to love learning. So I think my career journey started with the love of learning. So I love to learn. And my career kind of combines a little bit of my dad and my mom. So with him being an engineer, my mom, a nurse, um, my career was supposed to be, or was ordained, I think, to be somewhere at the, the cross point between healthcare, engineering, and entrepreneurship, which is what it eventually became. Mm -hmm. um, so my learning about entrepreneurship was interning at that company every summer by force <laughs> by force you <laughs> said by force by force <laughs> but fast forward i see the benefits he wanted us to understand where the money came from to to feed to shelter and things like that so that was helpful um and then more importantly he said i'm my own boss so i can i can make some decisions um and, and it's not easy he always will say on easy lies the hairs the head that wears a crown. He loves Shakespeare. So he said that all the time. So now I, I, I know why my head feels heavy. So <laughs> my medical career started in Nigeria. I went to medical school in Nigeria. Uh, I got into medical school at the age of 16. I went to Nnamdi Azikiwe University and um, I became a physician in my early 20s. Um, I broke ranks with my friends and I did my postgraduate training in Ghana at Kalibu. And during wait, my wait a minute. I, I really have to stop you. Okay. You said I became a physician. Say that again for me. I became okay. a physician in my early 20s. In your early when did you start medical school? At 16. So with um Nigeria. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, <laughs> that that just sort of you have that rolling off the tongue that you started medical school at 16. So That's clearly cool. you you were an incredible high school student. Thanks to my dad, again, <laughs> he, he made us love learning. So, well, my brother beat me to it. He got into college at 15. <laughs> so, oh my uh, goodness. I know. So, um, yeah, and we in, in Nigeria, like uh, most other countries, we, we use the British system, which is a straight six years. The first two years, you're pre-med and the last four years, clinical uh, medicine and stuff. So um, it's not too uncommon, but it is, it is an accomplishment to, to have started that young. Um, so now with clinical practice, I realized I had a passion, um, not only for having patient care delivery that was equitable, uh, but also combining that with bringing value to others. Um, and then sculpting my path, understanding how that ties into technology and business and things like that. Uh, it, it wasn't easy for me. Uh, my dad was very traditional. So you're a doctor, you, you know, hold your stethoscope and that's it. Um, I wish at the time I knew people like Sanjay Gupta, who could be a neurosurgeon and a journalist, because that would be, okay, you know, uh, there's this multidimensional side to people. And, and that also carries through in your career. And you, you don't have to fit in a box. You can actually create your own path. 
So my thoughts there, you know, wandering and, and forming at that point. So I relocated back to the U.S. in 2004 uh, to New Orleans, uh, to Lane University to do my master's in public health with a focus in international health. And I completed that in just nine months. Um, during okay, that you keep breaking records. I, I, I just want to know that there's an expression, it's called a mic drop, when you do something or when you say something that's so powerful that you, you just, you, you can't even use the microphone next. So you said you came back and you finished, you did your master's with a focus in international health. Am I saying that correctly? I did my master's in public health with a focus in international health. And you completed that in how quickly? In nine months. So in Louisiana. In Louisiana, at Tulane. Wow. Wow. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Continue on. I'm sorry. Every now and then I just have to stop because you say this because I, I can explain that a little. Uh, if, you, if you do come into the college with a, a medical degree, they waive certain um, core courses because you've taken biology and things like that. So I would say that helped a bit. And when they told me, oh, you only have 32 credits, I said, that's easy. Split it in two, half here, half there, and we're good. So <laughs> that's really what happened. <laughs> Well, so, okay, so so now now all of this time, right now, I'm not hearing much about social life. I'm hearing, it seems like you are just really focused. And you, you said something interesting. You said your dad's pretty traditional. If, you, if you're a physician, just hold your stethoscope. But you weren't being content. So were, were there, was, let's see, was there contention in the house because you wanted to do more instead of just take your stethoscope, put on your white coat, and be happy that you are this huge success already? That was contention, and that's when my mom came in. But she understood the roundedness of it. And my dad, I could understand where he was coming from. He came from very, very humble beginnings. And had he not been able to study and get a scholarship to school, he would have ended up uh, trade or farming. or So for him, education was his way out. Okay. So that's why his blind spot was everything education. But my mom knew, you know, you have to be balanced. So when he's not watching, she'll approve for you to go do some sports or do something fun, go to the party, <laughs> to the extent that he's not so upset. But yeah, so she did that. And fast since you asked, um, when I was doing my, um, uh, my, uh, my MPH, because my focus was international health, I got the opportunity to study abroad. Uh, so I did Asia and some countries in Asia and Africa and taking a closer look at disparities across different healthcare systems became very interesting for me. Uh, the one that was mo most notable was Thailand. Uh, we did do, do a six weeks course in Thailand and we uh, split our time between Bangkok and Chiang Mai, which is Chiang Mai is more rural. And it, it was just fascinating to understand how they curbed the HIV um, epidemic at the time they were um, being identified uh, by the World Health Organization as a country to watch in terms of addressing that public health issue. So that was very fascinating to learn about healthcare outside of the doctor's office in detail. We have to go into the markets, go into the, I'm sorry, brotels and things like that and all understanding the social behaviors that impacted uh, healthcare. Um, so that was fascinating for me. And again, um, fast forward, coming back to the United States, I now knew at this point in time that I would definitely move farther away uh, from core clinical practice and, and really look at things more from a 50,000 foot view. So I did complete my MBA and then transition to the business side of healthcare uh, and then work for health, health insurance and administrative uh, organizations, um, including Kaiser Hopkins, you mentioned that already. And I became very astute in knowing how to link silos between the health insurance side and the provider side and how technology kind of ties all that in. So working with executives was also important because they make decisions and that's a very important part of the, the puzzle. So through it all, I ended up with my medical, medical degree and three master's degree in public oh, health, yeah. business administration and project management. I didn't stop there. I did have uh, three certifications in quality improvement, change management, and data analytics. That's incredible. Uh, congratulations to you. The, I mean, th those are outstanding achievements. That's really incredible. And I guess for me, I'm thinking, 
and, and not to speak and speaking to what your father was saying, you're a doctor and that should have been fine. You could easily have stayed on the other side of the desk, the other side of the room and just stayed in the medical profession. But the thing that fascinated you on these these tours that you went on, as particularly in Thailand, as you mentioned, you saw a need at that point. It, you realized you wanted to be more of a, I, I don't know, I'm not going to call you a patient advocate because I think you're working just to kind of get some real congruency around everything. So, I mean, I find that I just find that an amazing career change. It's like, great, I have this medical degree and I've done all this, but now I want to use it in a business way to improve lives, which is interesting. Thank you. That is true. And you did ask me an interesting question in terms of, did I study all the time? Well, it some of my classmates are watching, they'll tell you, oh, no, she, she was a very social person too. Uh, and, and I think that the formal learnings that I got from the education that I, I went through, was they, they were great, but I also had informal learnings. Along the way, thanks to my mom's starters, I learned how to cook and clean uh, ideas. I do hairstyling and yes, I love fashion. So all that fold into who I am is, is quite multidimensional. I love that. So you, you used a word earlier, and when we come back from break, we're going to dig a little bit more into some of the things that you've said. You mentioned that you were a Kaizen entrepreneur, and that word, that's not a word I was familiar with before. So what does that exactly mean? Just very quickly before we go to break. Well, I coined that phrase uh, when I was doing my uh, certification in quality improvement at Hopkins at the Armstrong Institute. Uh, this, it, we were learning how you continuously improve a process because that's the only way you would attain high quality. So in that, we understood that most of the science of quality improvement came from Japan. And uh, Kaizen is a Japanese term which means you continuously improve. And I think if you listen to my story, I always wanted to be better. I always pushed the envelope. So I said, you know what? Hmm, I am a Kaizen entrepreneur. And that's I where it. I it from. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Hold on to those thoughts. Everybody hold on to your seats. Listeners and viewers will be back after this break with more from Dr. Inkem.
and we're back on Marketplace TV. Today, we're talking to Dr. Inkem about her amazing journey. Dr. Inkem, you've given us so much to think about, and I'm, I'm just just regrouping from the last two segments where you shared your childhood, the kind of uh, the wonderful force that both your mom and your dad had in your life. And then some of the things you did getting through medical school, having, if I'm saying it correctly, three master's degrees plus additional certifications. So you've worked for some pr impressive organizations, some of the most well-respected organizations in the country, Kaiser Permanente, Booz Allen Hamilton, and Johns Hopkins. Most people would have picked any one of the three and decided that that would be their career to retirement, but that wasn't enough for you. You decided you needed to become the founder and CEO of Medical Links. Please tell us what that is all about. Absolutely. So I founded Medical Links um, out of a, a need. Uh, two, it was twofold. First of all, I, I think that the world of bridging uh, the provider side and the payer side uh, was needed. And uh, as we were moving to what is now known as value-based care, uh, which means care that uh, takes in co into consideration the outcome of the patients. For example, if you have diabetes, you go to see a doctor 10 times a year, from the start of the year to the end of the year, did your condition improve? Did your HbA1c go down? So, or did you just keep going and it, it stayed the same? So uh, that, that's the term uh, that has been coined to sort of think of things in that more holistic way, value-based care. So there's a need for the insurance side and the, the provider side to, to kind of have a meeting of the minds and work closely together. So first of all, that was a niche. Um, having done that for all the organizations that you pointed out, I felt that I could uh, do it in a way that was a bit more unique and more agile and nimble, uh, definitely as a small organization. So we are a population health management firm, and that's what we do. We consider ourselves as a bridge between the payer and the provider side. And we do that by... Um, supporting my practicing colleagues as an extended team to theirs. Uh, while we focus on working on chronic diseases that impact the, the health of the population, we also hone in on community health care. Uh, and, and it's important because social determinant is an issue and does impact the outcomes of, of population health. And, the, the, and healthcare is local. So the more we can understand how to piece those things together, uh, the more we can support uh, my practicing colleagues who are in the doctor's office doing the best they can to try and make their patients whole. So that's really what uh, Medical Links does as it, as it, at, at its core. Now, if the next question you ask me or the question you ask me, therein lies um, why. Um, not only was that a, a, a pain point to solve uh, for the that we support, it was also an opportunity to allow minorities um, the liberty to accelerate their career growth. Um, as you know, uh, as a woman of color and a black woman, uh, you have your, you know, what I say challenges as you try to climb up the ladder. And, you know, I think why not wasting time to point fingers and, um, and and blame things? You can definitely continue advocating to make sure that that's better, uh, which I do. Uh, but what else could I do that was more practical? So founding a company and being able to be an employer and employ people uh, was another way to do it. So uh, we're over 80% uh, minorities, uh, not that we choose to do so, but it just so happens that this creates the, and that avenue to, to uh, afford uh, other people the the pathway to accelerate in their career that they otherwise would not have the opportunity to do so. So let me ask you with medical links because you 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 think you you have spoken in terms of your colleagues in the medical field. Are you reaching out to individual doctors or do you reach to do you reach to organizations? I'm trying to figure out who is the client of medical links. Uh, it's we have a number of client uh, of let's say client categories. Uh, so we start with my, because I transitioned, you know, from work life in the corporate world into forming my organization from the payer side, that was a natural first category of clients. So healthcare insurance companies are, are our clients. Uh, however, 
again, because they cannot be successful without partnering with the providers by practicing calls on the other end. So being able to also have them as our clients is important. Uh, it depends on how uh, the initiative is structured, uh, but also for my practicing calls, especially those who are independent um, uh, solo practice uh, physician, solo practitioners, we kind of speak the language of understanding where they're coming from and where the pay or health insurance companies are coming from to see how they can improve the contractual relationship uh, and still be made whole to focus on patient care. Right. And, and I have to tell you, I never heard of the term value-based care. I've not had anybody say that to me. I, I see, I can see where that objective is, is designed to happen in my own healthcare, but I've, n I've never heard somebody use that term for me. So that's really interesting. Now you've got medical links, but then you founded the next one, which is health links. So what's the difference between the two? Great question. Uh, is a story behind it. Okay. So as our nurses were working with uh, a patient who has special needs, uh, they would not get covered for a particular uh, model of wheelchair that they needed. Uh, and they felt compelled to do something about it. So they had come and we talked about it and said, we should start a fund of some sort so that if we have uh, patients who cannot afford some uh, durable medical equipment beyond what the insurance will cover, how can we help them? It's just a couple more hundred dollars, thousand dollars, something like that. So being a for-profit organization, uh, we couldn't stand that up uh, as readily and, and, and with a vision to make that broader. So Health Links is, uh, was founded as a non-profit organization uh, with that sole purpose of starting that fund. We call it the Care Resource Fund. And through that, we help patients uh, who need additional uh, funding to uh, support their medical needs. That's incredible. And I applaud you for that. My question becomes, how would a person know about this fund? Is it that you're, the practitioners that you're working with identify someone and refer them to you? How do, how do they get what they need? That's smart. So right now it has been internal referrals. So we, we serve over 4,000 patients across the state of Maryland and beyond. And the uh, care managers and community health workers know the needs of the patients they directly work with. So when they identify uh, those issues, they apply through the committee and say, you know, we have someone who might need this help and they apply and they get that. We've even had people reach out just before they were giving away free masks and say, you know, I want, you know, free masks for my children, go to school. And we, through the fund, were able to fund that. Now, uh, for 2022, we're taking it to the next level. So now we're applying for grants to, to see how we can continue to support with this pandemic and, and stopping it uh, in its tracks, as well as uh, doing all the population health management um, uh, uh, programs. Uh, but this will be under a different management. This, is, this sounds so exciting. And I know you're excited about what you do. You're very passionate about you, what you do. But you said something to me one time in conversation that stuck. You said, I am sculpted. And I, I love that term. But what you wanted me to understand is there is there's Dr. Inkem, but there is so much more to you because I, a lot of what you're doing, any one of the any step along the way could have been your career slot and you stayed there. But as you as you mentioned, being Kaizen or Kaizen, if I'm saying it right, Kaizen. You're, always, Kaizen, you're always improving. So what do you mean by your sculpted? How does that affect you and your family? So good question. Um, let me start with the last one. Uh, how does it affect my family? Um, I will say I want to thank my family mostly because they sacrifice. Uh, however, um, I also was very strategic in what I was doing. The medical links was not founded sooner because I had kids and I had to make sure I had a job that could afford me <laughs> breastfeed and <laughs> do what I need to do as a mom. And, uh, and as they grew older, then I felt I could, you know, spread my wings a little bit more. Uh, but still, it comes at a cost. I mean, it's a dance here, a swim lesson there. Uh, but I think I look forward to the legacy that I'm carrying on from my father and my mom going forward. And the kids now understand that. So that's the, that part. And the other piece, which is pretty much trying to understand um, how the sculpting comes to be. When I was doing my MBA, I read this Harvard Business Review article that, called, that was titled Job Sculpting, I believe. And I think it was the first time that I 
thought someone was speaking to me because <laughs> many times when these ideas came in my head in terms of the different paths I could take, it seemed like I was, an, you know, I was uh, a misfit. Or an, you know, wh why would she want to do that? Oh, can, can you tell me exactly what your focus is? So at some point in time, I stopped explaining myself. And when I read the article, I said, okay, yeah, there are uh, folks who tap into their inner person to see that they are multidimensional. And you may never get around it. We're just so blessed that way. Um, so I, I'm just lucky and fortunate that God uh, has afforded me the opportunity to be able to tap into more of my multi-dimensionality. <laughs> well, I am loving it. And when we come back from this last break, we are going to round out our discussion with more of your multi-dimensionalization. <laughs> Stay tuned, everyone. Time. It has a different meaning in the U.S. Virgin Islands. It goes backwards, forwards, it stops. St. Croix is rooted in history. So much of it still remains untouched. I remember running on these streets as a kid. This trap was right down there. It opened the same year I was born. This is where the original Crucian Hook was born. It's the symbol of these islands. And I wanted to have my hands in that very same history. I want to be able to pass it down to my family while still putting a new spin on it. The U.S. Virgin Islands, we have an amazing culture that developed over time from all over the world. St. John feels so untouched. Being underwater is like another world. There's no worries, there's no stress. I can just escape. This is my happy place. My passion for scuba diving came at just being fascinated with the water and wanting to be a mermaid. And this is the closest thing I can get to achieving mermaid status. <laughs> Canadians just love being outdoorsy. We live for adventure, so we love anything hiking, being on the water, diving, snorkeling, and St. John has it all. It's like some spirit is protecting the island and keeping them raw. The Makujumbi watches over the island. From up there, they keep the evil spirits away. The nightlife in St. Thomas is absolutely amazing. There's always something going on. Everyone comes together to dance and catch a vibe. We're always celebrating. We celebrate freedom, culture, the food, the smell, the music. It's always a celebration. The people here are probably the most priceless thing because they keep the culture going. There's so many different influences on these islands. Food from all kinds of countries coming together in new dishes. <laughs> All of us came from somewhere, but all that we call this home. The VI is a new melting pot. This is where the past and the future comes together.
Welcome back to the Marketplace TV on RTV Network. And I'm here today with Dr. Inkem. And you really have helped us so much. Your, your story is just such a compelling one and really inspiring on so many levels. I mean, with all you've done, you should be 100 years old, and yet you're not. So when we left, we were talking about the fact that you used the term you're sculpted meaning multidimensional and always ready to show off another dimension. I want to ask you about your other two companies before we sort of announce what's really very exciting for RTV. What is Coordinate? So Coordinate is a health IT company that's uh, budding. Uh, we will have our uh, self-release at the end of the month. Um, so it is an electronic health record system. Uh, that we build, which takes into consideration the community health services that we offer to uh, the patients that we, we serve um, and being able to have that seamless communication amongst team members. Uh, so if you know Epic, Cerna, uh, those are bigger names, uh, they're electronic medical records. Um, this is kind of a, a small version of that, uh, but focused more on community health uh, support and uh, care coordination. It just, to me, it's amazing because literally you really have coined the phrase Kaizen, uh, Kaizen, because this is your, anything along the way would have been a great stopping point to just kind of coast to retirement and you keep going. So now, so we've got the medical links, health links, coordinate. Now, what is consociator? So consociator is coined from the word consociate, which means who do you associate with? As you can appreciate, um, I belong to a lot of great uh, associations that uh, have great missions. And I thought that it was about time that professionals knew what was out there. Um, so if you want to be plugged in, uh, you can you can have have a, a, a place where you go, a platform where you go, where you can, first of all, start by feeding into it what you're looking for? Are you looking for a tribe? Are you looking for return on your investment? Are you looking to just have a social network? And all those things kind of culminate into the platform of giving you uh, a recommendation. It's almost like if you want to go get health and um, car insurance and you put in some information and they will tell you, well, you can start with Geico and stay Farm and this and that and the other. Uh, so something like that, but more in-depth and intuitive. So it started off with something that I was using for myself and built some algorithm to, to help me make decisions uh, because it's only 24 hours in a day. Um, so I have to pick and choose and it may change from month to month, year to year. So now just to be able to expand on that and offer that to you, my colleagues, and also associations to, to be able to hone in on the key members that they seek all the time. I thought that that was a value add. So while it had nothing to do with healthcare per se, it, it was something again that my business had uh, thought to to offer is solving a problem. That's what entrepreneurship I is. I love that. I mean, this is incredible to me. So if a person's interested in joining an organization or a club or an association, this is really kind of going to do that one of those comparisons and then we we pick what will best be the best use of our time so to speak exactly. i love it i think it's absolutely brilliant so you really you really are sculpted i mean this is the multifacetedness of all of this is really blowing my mind but that takes me to some of the next steps and why i'm so excited of uh, being executive producer for cfn and working with the marketplace on rtv etc to be able to announce to everyone that starting uh, this month actually you will have your own monthly television show where you're going to be able to share a ton of things. And can you tell us the name of your brand new RTV Network television show? It'll be called Value 360. Value so, 360. So why Value 360? Because. Oh, and there's, your great, there's a great graphic. There you are. Value 360 with Dr. Inkem. Yes. So again, I, I am coming from my my own experience. And, and Carolyn, you can relate with this, and I'm sure many more people, we are multidimensional. So I think being able to put that together in a very rounded way and just share, you know, my journey um, and my experience and also invite others to share the experience, I think we can give the audience 
would I say, ripplets of value that they can take with them and apply in real time. I'm a very practical person. I, I study and I have theories that I, you know, I can try to, to see if this is true or not, but I get very practical. So being able to say this is exactly what I do, how I did it, if that is a learning you can take from there, invite you know, smart minds like you and others and say, what have you learned? Because I think that, you know, there's only so much time in a day to experience everything yourself. So <laughs> can, if you're able to, you know, I, will I say steal or borrow um, some ripple, uh, you know, uh, of ripples of value from others, I think, why not? I absolutely love that. And I think you're wise. I, I think it would be foolish. It's, people say experience is the best teacher. I've heard people say that often. And I, while experience is a teacher, mm -hmm. some experiences may be the very less experience you ever had. So that's not wise. It is better to learn from the experience of others because clearly we can't rewalk your path, but the things that you have to share with us can really impact us in positive ways. So what kinds of topics are you going to be talking about on your new show, Value 360? Absolutely. So first of all, I'll, I'll still keep my daytime job okay, good. <laughs> as a, a healthcare physician, executive and businesswoman. Um, but my showtime job will now be, your show time time. Job. <laughs> will now be spending time with the audience, uh, you know, helping working professionals, young adults sculpt their multidimensional potential. Um, having shared my story already um, in the first three segments, you can see I'm sculpted in the different dimensions that come together to make me thick. And I believe that's the same for everybody. So I believe in the understanding that I alone cannot change the world, but I can cause a ripple. And sharing my experience and those of others, as I mentioned before, is a way that we can cause that ripple effect um, and people can actually see this as a, a beneficial uh, series. Uh, topics we'll cover will span across health and wellness, entrepreneurship, cultural harmony, legacy, and Kaizen 101. That's incredible. So we're going to get a lesson in Kaizen 101. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're still writing the chapters of what that will all be about. So this is really, really exciting when I think about the opportunity that whether you're a business person or just a, in the medical field, excuse me, business person in the medical field or any kind of field, there are lessons that can be learned from you. Now, will you also be share, uh, sharing some strategies, if you will, medical strategies? Yes. I mean, again, for example, now the COVID pandemic is here, uh, who would have known? So everybody somewhere, somehow is now has 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 some level of expertise in healthcare. Whether you know when to put on your mask, take it off, go to a social event, you know. Well, this, social is, this is amazing. <laughs> I want to thank you for being our guest here today. I think you are tremendous, and your program, Value Three Hundred and Sixty, is going to have so many wonderful things that we're all going to benefit from. So everyone, thank you for watching us here on our TV network, uh, The Marketplace. Dr. In Kim, thank you for being here. We look forward to Value 360. We'll keep checking the social media and see your show live in later this month. Everyone have a great day. Bye-bye.